Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast, episode number 491, an interview with cardiologist Dr. Michael Twine. Biobalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Moppin, medical director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moffin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at Biobalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. Today we have a special guest, Michael Twyman. He is a physician, he is board certified in cardiology, and he has taken the road less traveled. He is now be- has become a preventive cardiologist, someone who checks you and evaluates you and decides how best to have you not have a heart attack, not have heart disease, not have a stroke, how to protect your blood vessels so that that is not something that takes your quality of life away. And he is someone who has amazing innovative skills in terms of his practice. And he is, he is the foremost innovator in terms of prevention for heart disease. So we're very honored to have him here. And we want to know, or I want to know, the three different, the three best tests for for us to have to find out if we're at risk for heart disease, and this is above and beyond blood tests. Correct. So first off, thank you for having me here today. It's you know, great to talk to like-minded individuals who are in the game of prevention. Uh-huh. Um, so the top three tests that I recommend people consider getting done to assess their true risk of a heart uh-huh. attack are one, the CT coronary calcium score. Two, a test called the CIMT, it stands for carotid intima median thickness. It's an ultrasound of the neck arteries. And the third test I recommend is called an endopat, which tests endothelial function, which we'll get into what that actually means. So we've talked about some of these in our other um, in our other health casts. From my perspective, which is not cardiology, I send my patients to you mm-hmm. if I feel like they need more testing or they're at risk because of their their lipids or if they have problems with their statins and they need to be off their statins. I want to know what their risk is if they're, if they go off their statins. So I send those patients to you and then you evaluate them. And since we have kind of a like-minded approach, we use supplements, we use lifestyle changes Mm -hmm. and we use medicines, but we want to know what somebody has first and not just throw things at them and assume they have heart disease when they don't. Correct. So the very first test that you mentioned is a cardiac calcium scan. And I order that for people and then send them to you. Mm-hmm. And I'd like you to explain it and also explain the, explain the rating uh, or the score because they, there are several different scores that I see okay. and I don't really understand the difference. Sure. So the first test recommended is called the CT coronary calcium score calcium scan. It's a low-dose radiation CT scan. That's looking for calcium in the walls of your arteries. You have three arteries that sound on the outside of the heart called the coronary arteries that provide the nutrients to the heart. And calcium, obviously, is supposed to be in your bones and teeth. It's not supposed to be building up in your blood vessels. Uh-huh. So the CT scan looks for the amount of calcium in the walls of the arteries. Uh-huh. If your calcium score is zero, your risk of a heart attack is extremely low and probably can forego taking high-dose medications to reverse, quote, high cholesterol. Mostly work on lifestyle and supplements if need to. Mm-hmm. If calcium scores over 400, that's a high-risk individual. That person probably has you know, up to a 90% chance one of their three arteries has a severe blockage in it, meaning one of the arteries has a 70% blockage in it. Wow. And so they may not have symptoms at that point, so they might not necessarily need, quote, a stent or bypass surgery, but they need much more aggressive lifestyle supplements and medications to stabilize any plaque to help reverse it. So this is the only test I usually tell patients you want to be a zero. If you're a zero, you're good to go. You know, I've seen mm-hmm. patients up in their 80s have scores of zero. I've seen Mm -hmm. people as young in their 30s have very high scores. So just looking at somebody, you can't tell what their risk is. You really have to test to evaluate the risk. From what I understand and what I've seen in my patients is that lipid tests don't don't always tell whether someone's going to be at risk for heart attack. We add 
CRP, which is inflammation, and those two together give us a better kind of blind view because we're not looking at the vessels. But, but do you see some people who are normal lipids, normal inflammation, but have high calcium scores? Not as common, but, you know, your point of, you know, it's not all about cholesterol. There might be three to 400 things that end up, you know, laying plaque down in your arteries. Mm -hmm. Damaged cholesterol is always going to be present, but mm -hmm. it's not always the initiator. Um, so you want to go looking at the arteries themselves to see is plaque forming before you really start getting too aggressive lowering a lab value. Uh, but cholesterol, you know, 50% of people who come into the hospital with heart attacks, they have, quote, normal cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, like I said, you just look at them from the outside. You don't know how healthy the plumbing is on the inside. So this test gives you a lot better bird's eye view of what's going on actually in this patient. Correct. So that's a test that I'm, I'm used to and I'm, I'm commonly order. I don't order CIMT. Mm -hmm. I let you do that because that's something that I'm not... I, I wasn't trained with, and I haven't become I haven't become conversant in it. So it's more of a specialty test, in my view. So could you please tell me what that is, and and who needs it, and 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 what it will tell us? Sure. So the uh, the CIMT or carotid intimomedial thickness scan is an ultrasound of the arteries on the side of your neck. There's a traditional medical ultrasound test called the carotid duplex, where they're measuring the flow in the artery. Mm -hmm. That's looking for more severe blockages in the carotid artery. So if your doctor puts a stethoscope on your neck and hears a brewy, which sounds like you know, your finger over a garden hose here in the whooshing, <laughs> that means you probably have a pretty severe stenosis, and that's kind of a late stage finding. And stenosis is like a blockage, a blockage. in the arteries. And typically you have to have a greater than 70% blockage in the carotid artery before they're going to consider a procedure or surgery. Mm -hmm. But the CIMT uses the same basic technology as an ultrasound probe, so no radiation, but they're measuring the inner lining of the blood vessels. So they're measuring the first layer of uh, cells and then the muscle, the medium. And there's supposed mm -hmm. to be a certain thickness as you age. The thicker the artery, the more inflammation of the artery, and the more likelihood soft plaque is developing in that artery. I see. So this test will give you a vascular age because if you're you know, biologically 50 years old but your arteries are 70 years old, you probably want to do something about that. Mm -hmm. Your artery's on fire, and you got to really dig into why is that plaque developing or the inflammation the artery is developing. It has a high correlation that if you have an abnormal CIMT scan, you're going to have an abnormal calcium scan. And because the calcium scan involves radiation, not a lot. It's about the same amount as a mammogram, but you don't want to keep repeating when we do that test mm -hmm. uh, because of the dose of the radiation is cumulative over time. So you can do the carotid scan as a good surrogate to see what's going on with the plaque. So... CMT gives you a certain thickness, you implement some type of lifestyle change, mm -hmm. nutrient change, supplement change, diet change, or medications if needed, and then in a year, if things are going according to plan, mm -hmm. you'll see that plaque regressing, you'll see it getting better. So it can actually get better. And so I don't think that that's something that people really get, is that you can reverse your plaque load and the and the uh, narrowness of your arteries, because as as you might know or may not, when you have more plaque, then the area that you can push blood through gets smaller and smaller, which raises your blood pressure, which raises the work on the heart, which then, of course, is not good for you and is going to cause problems down the line that is even more, or, I mean, it can be deadly. Sure. And it can cause a stroke. If, it's, if, if you have that kind of compromise of the vessels to your brain, your carotids or your are your main arteries to your brain. You have other arteries to your brain, but th these are the main arteries, and those can cause a stroke if you don't get enough blood, therefore enough oxygen to your brain, parts of your brain can die. Or you can throw a clot or a, pla a little piece of plaque that will block the artery. So those are things that we talk about, like, oh, yeah, it's a stroke, but nobody really says, here's what a stroke really is and what it does. Just like a heart, a heart attack is death of your heart muscle because it didn't get enough oxygen because the vessel was blocked. So that's kind of the basic non-scientific description of what happens with a heart attack. And that's what we're trying to prevent people from having. That causes your heart not to pump very well. And therefore, then you become a, you're short of breath. You become a heart cripple. You don't have, you don't have the energy or the oxygenation or the blood flow that you can actually live like a regular person. You have to have help. We don't want our patients ever to be compromised so that they need their children or their friends to take care of them. Correct. I mean, you know, I have, you know, 
traditional cardiology training. I still know how to take care of a heart attack, but I'd much rather get to the patient way before that stage happens. And it's not that it's too late once they have the heart attack, but it's much more satisfying for me professionally to work with a patient, find the risk factors early, find if they have disease early, mm -hmm. and try to work on stabilizing it so they never have that first heart attack, that first stroke. And that's what we, we are always trying to make people healthier so that they aren't going to have the diseases of aging. And this is the primary killer of right. patients when they do age. So another test, the third test that you talk about that I don't know anything about <laughs> is the endothelial test, the test of, of the endothelium, the lining of the artery. Correct. So the device that I use in my office is called the endopad. It's testing for endothelial function. The endothelium is the inner lining of your blood vessels. It's one cell thick, but if you took out all the endothelium of your blood vessels and laid it flat, it has about the surface area of six tennis courts. So it's one of your largest organs. Wow, so, I had no idea. Yeah, so that was always a fun fact I learned when I was doing some of my advanced training. But the endothelium is really the first line of defense uh, between where the lumen is, where the blood is flowing, and the walls of the arteries, because mm -hmm. plaque starts building up in the walls of the arteries. And the lumen, you know, can be wide open for the longest period of time, but if the endothelium starts getting damaged, it's not necessarily like leaky gut, but it's similar, where if the endothelium starts kind of becoming dysfunctional, things that are flowing in the blood can get stuck down below the walls of the artery and start oh. building up that plaque. Mm -hmm. The endothelium potentially can be damaged six, seven years before the plaque actually starts building up. So mm -hmm. it's one of the earliest findings, if not the earliest finding, of vessel disease. So young people can have this done to see if they're going to develop plaque later. Correct. So there's kind of two populations that should consider the test. One, you think you're healthy and you want to know how healthy are your arteries. So if you have a calcium score of zero, you have a CIMT that's, you know, your biologic age and vascular age are the same or less, you know, you're probably pretty low risk. But if you have endothelial dysfunction and you don't change something, six, seven years down the road, you're going to probably start putting plaque down in the arteries. So it's a good test for younger people. You know, how young? Maybe, you know, 30s if they have a strong family history, but otherwise generally 40 is about the usual mm -hmm. starting point. The other class of people that would benefit from this test is somebody who already has a stent, has already had a heart attack, had bypass. The calcium score test is not for them, or the CT calcium score test is not for them, because they're already you know, deemed a high-risk individual. Uh -huh. The CIMT test can still be used because you can see, well, if they're doing all this aggressive cardiac rehab and nutrition changes and lifestyle uh -huh. changes and meds and supplements, is the plaque getting better? You can still do that test every uh -huh. year. But if you really want to know is how things are improving right now, you would test the endothelium right then to see. Because if the endothelium is healthy, you'll be able to pretty much be confident that they're not going to keep laying down plaque in their arteries. And the way the test actually works is it's about a 15-minute test. You have two finger probes on your finger. It's kind of like a pulse oximetry where they're measuring the peripheral arterial tone. It's basically the blood flow in the small blood vessels in your fingers. Mm -hmm. And you're laying flat on the table for a while. Uh, five minutes, you monitor the flow through the fingers. Mm -hmm. After five minutes, you have a blood pressure cuff on their non-dominant arm and you pump up the blood pressure cuff higher than their blood pressure to temporarily cut off the blood flow to the hand. Mm -hmm. So they'll probably get that pins and needles sensation in their hand. Mm -hmm. And on the monitor, the control arm is still going to have this little wave and it's mm -hmm. going to be looking normal. This arm looks like a flat line. Mm -hmm. After five minutes, you open up the blood pressure cuff, the blood rushes back down, and if the arteries are healthy, they see this huge slug of blood, they want to dilate. So they release nitric oxide mm -hmm. to dilate. The arteries should dilate by at least two times, so it should double in size to be considered to have normal endothelial function. And the thing that's making it dilate is that nitric oxide. You know, nitric oxide is, has many functions in the body, but for in the blood vessel system, the two major ones is that it dilates it, so it's going to help lower the blood pressure, mm -hmm. but it also somewhat acts like Teflon, prevents stuff from sticking to the arteries and starting to damage it in the first place. Oh, I didn't know that. And it's produced by the endothelium, is that correct? Correct. correct. And as we get older, does it go, it, tends to it go down. decreases? Yes. So we use Neo40 to help people just have enough nitric oxide, even especially if they don't have enough, if they don't have a normal test, or if they have ED, because ED is one of the signs that someone's vessels, I mean, it's a gross sign. It doesn't necessarily mean that your vessels aren't working. Right. But it can be a sign of a future heart attack, and it can be a sign that your nitric oxide is low and that your endothelium is damaged. Correct. So that's something that I see all the time because people come in for testosterone. And that's my first move. And if, it, if testosterone fixes it, great. And, and if everything else looks normal and their heart looks normal, then great. But if it doesn't, then they're off to see you. Right. And I think it's kind of a two-way street. You know, They either get into my world first, and I'm talking to them about 
you know, their heart health and then, you know, they tell me they have erectile dysfunction or they, you know, low libido mm -hmm. and then, you know, I'll check, you know, the male panel and mm -hmm. they are low. You know, that's something, something is going on in their environment that they need to fix to try to improve mm -hmm. their hormones. And so that's why I send them over to you. Mm -hmm. um, or they come to you and, you know, they're coming in there first. You find they have erectile dysfunction. That's a big red flag that there might be something going on with their heart mm -hmm. because erectile dysfunction is more times than not, it's due to the small blood vessels to the penis mm -hmm. having a blockage. Mm -hmm. So if you have blockages there, you very possibly have blockages in your heart. So mm -hmm. I always pretty much always get a calcium scan on somebody who comes in with the complaints of erectile dysfunction and likely get the other two tests as well. That's, it, that's a great idea. I, I don't always get the follow through that I like mm -hmm. when I ask people to get that, but it's but here in St. Louis, the cardiac calcium scans are self pay, but they're only ninety nine dollars. $99 is, you know, going out for dinner. I mean, this can tell you whether you need help and you need and how long if you're going to live long or not. And it I mean, the last thing you want is a heart attack that you don't even expect out in the middle of nowhere or in in a busy on a busy street or behind the wheel, goodness, that would just be disastrous. But that's that's the last thing we want. We want to know if we're at risk. I mean, we should want to know if we're at risk and what to do about it before it happens. So it's not just about, be oh, I want to be healthy. And people say that for about a minute, and then they forget, and then they eat junk, and then they don't exercise. and they So they aren't motivated. But this is about a long, healthy life without disability. Right. And to me, that's everything. I mean, especially now that I'm 65, I'm like, gosh, you know, now I'm on that edge where... I look at everybody else around me and things are happening to them, bad things, and if they're, especially if they're not my patients. Right. Right. <laughs> but um, since I take care of most of my friends, they'll probably be around with me right. <laughs> for a long time. So, um, and we take care of them, and you take care of my husband as well, and I thank you for that. Oh, sure. So um, some of the things that I think, honestly, I think we've, we've gone through many of the things that you specialize in, but you also have some... Uh, specialty in circadian rhythms. Correct. Now, we didn't say that we were going to talk about this, but I'd really like to talk about it. Sure. Because could, would you mind defining that for, for everybody who's listening? Because it's very important, and it's what I think what caused me to have so much illness while I was in OBGYN because my circadian rhythms were off because I was up all night. Correct. I mean, that's a major risk factor for healthcare workers and first responders is, you know, they're working the night shift and their circadian rhythms get dysregulated. And circadian is basically your 24 hour cycle. Mm -hmm. And there's two major things that set your circadian rhythm. It's the light that enters your eyes and hits your skin. Mm -hmm. And it's the timing of your meals. And I got into this three, four years ago when I was flying to Thailand, it was like a 12 hour flight. And I was doing some research about, you know, how do I kind of beat the jet lag mm -hmm. and came upon some articles talking about controlling your circadian rhythms by timing your meals and wearing these funny mm -hmm. pairs of glasses that filter the light. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand the science at that point. I just did it, flew there, mm -hmm. and the jet lag was not nearly as bad as I was expecting. So I was like, there has to be something to the science to this. So when I go back to the States, I've been doing some significant deep dives in the past three years about mm -hmm. circadian rhythm management. So that's a bedrock of my practice right now is that if your circadian rhythms are mismatched, you know, it's going to be very hard to have optimal health. So I always will start with trying to control people's timing of their meals and then try to optimize their sleep if they're not sleeping well. So what's an optimal timing of, for the normal circadian rhythm? What is, what is the optimal time that we should be eating? So I typically tell people that you know 12 hours or less, that comes out of the, the work of Dr. Sachin Panda. Uh, he has a book called The Circadian Code that kind of explains mm -hmm. all the science and data behind it. Mm -hmm. But you know, your liver and gut, they're programmed more by the timing that nutrients come into the system. So mm -hmm. first thing you put in your mouth in the morning that isn't water, potentially triggers these clocks in the liver and the gut. Mm -hmm. All the cells in the body have clocks, little genes that turn on depending on the light or the food. You know, light programs the one in the brain that talks to everything else, but the gut and liver turn on mostly by the time the nutrients come in. They need about three to four hours of nothing coming into the system before they shut that clock off. Okay. So if you really want to have optimal body composition, optimal blood sugar, optimal sleep, you need to give the gut and liver time to shut off before you go to sleep. I see. So if you're natural bedtime's 10 o'clock at night, you want to stop eating by 6, 7 o'clock at night mm -hmm. so that machinery can shut off. Or you need to go to bed later. Or you go to bed later, <laughs> if that's your natural you know, right. bedtime. Yeah. Well, I have a hard time with um, winter. 
because I mean, because I guess I wasn't really meant to be in the middle northern hemisphere. I mean, this. I mean, I think my genetics were more south, and I need more sunlight. And so I have a hard time. What do we? What does a patient do when they're north of Louisiana, <laughs> and they have they have so much darkness? Sure. So uh, seasonal affective disorder is extremely uh, common. Yeah, it's you know reported only as five percent population, but it's likely much higher than that. But seasonal affective disorder essentially is a lack of solar exposure that time of year. Um, if you're going to tell patients that you know you are solar powered, your skin is meant to be out in the sun. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe not 24 hours a day, but you're programming your hormones and different neurotransmitters based off the time of day that certain wavelengths of light hit your skin, and the intensity of the sun programs different things on your skin and through your eyes. So you're meant to be outside. The cold tends to drive people inside, and they end up living inside 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. And they start getting their bodies dysregulated because these bright overhead lights that are over us and mm -hmm. these lights in front of us, mm -hmm. these lights tell your brain it's basically noontime in July. You make hormones off balance based off oh, of that I light see signal. That. Mm -hmm. But to your original question, you know, what can you do? It's try to get as much sunlight as possible. Even if it's cold outside, even if you can't see the sun, you know, there's about two months in St. Louis you're not making vitamin D on your skin because UVB radiation can't get through the atmosphere in St. Louis this time of year because mm -hmm. it's the latitude. But even if you don't get UV radiation, that red light, blue light in the morning time mm -hmm. turns up cortisol, wakes you up for the day, mm -hmm. red light's regenerative, mm -hmm. and the intensity of the light really helps you make the hormones optimally. So trying to get outside as much as you possibly can throughout the day is key. And not but, wearing sunglasses. And not wearing sunglasses um, because, you know, when, you know, next time you see your dog or cat wearing sunglasses, humans can wear sunglasses all the time. You know, <laughs> um, so I mean, your body was you know, up until a couple hundred years ago, you never had anything between your eyes and the sun. It's mm -hmm. you know, and now we have this massive flood of chronic disease, diabetes, obesity, mm -hmm. cancer. You know, is it all based off of sunglasses? Absolutely not. But you want to try to live as mu much of a natural life as possible. Um, but once you're back inside. You want to try to protect your eyes. So if you ever see me in the office or in public, I'm always having these type of glasses on. Mm -hmm. These glasses filter out certain wavelengths of blue light so it doesn't stimulate uh, certain receptors in the back of the eye. Mm -hmm. And then at nighttime, um, I have most of my lights off in the house and generally turn on red lights and stuff so that I'm not destroying my ability to release melatonin at nighttime. Oh, I see. I see. Well, that's, that really helps me because I didn't, I didn't really understand exactly what people should be doing so that's very informative to me as well so thank you so much for being here oh, we really welcome. appreciate it and we really appreciate your new information and i believe that because not everyone who listens is my patient yet so um they they can take this information back to their physicians and ask for the appropriate testing correct or they can come to see you. Yes. So, and Dr. Twyman is in currently in St. Louis, looking at all places all over yes. the world <laughs> uh, to uh, share his knowledge. And what is your phone number so people can call you if you if they so, want to become a patient? So it's honestly easy to just find me online. My website is ApolloCardiology.com, mm -hmm. or follow me on Instagram. It's Dr. Twyman. Um, T W Y M A N. Correct. Yeah. T-W-I-M-A-N, and you know, I'm pretty responsive on social media. If you direct message me, then and you're interested okay. in working with me, yeah, I'll put you in the right contact. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. We're very, we're very pleased that you could be here, and we will ask you back again. Thank you for listening, and stay healthy, please. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.